Hello, everyone, to the Reimagine Mobility podcast series. I'm here with Mohamed Musa from Epen. Thank you, Mohamed, for joining me today on, on helping me and our listeners and viewers reimagine mobility as we look forward in these very exciting times. Mohamed, explain what you're doing. What have you started with Deepen? What are you guys doing? And then let's afterwards jump right into how you, with your technologies, your products, help reimagine mobility in all sorts of areas of the mobility sector. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so hello, everyone. Great to be here. Thank you, Stefan, uh, for hosting me. I've started Deepen around six and a half years ago in 2017, early 2017, uh, looking at autonomous technologies, specifically autonomous vehicles. And at the time, we thought that autonomy will be sold by 2020. So we were trying to be part of that reimagination of mobility at scale. Unfortunately, now it's 2023, and we're still five years out from <laughs> from autonomous mobility, even though we've seen some good progress with companies like Cruise and Waymo expanding their operation in San Francisco and so on. But ultimately, as we saw kind of the wave of transportation and mobility specifically, enabling a wider segments of the population to have mobility access without owning the vehicle, reducing the cost, allowing for more access uh, on, on various sectors. Like, you know, for example, disabled people that their vehicles cost a lot more. Now with RoboTaxi, you can offer them uh, more cost-effective mobility, even less fortunate segments of the population who cannot afford a car. Now they can get affordable access to mobility. And most importantly, also safety, uh, given that uh, we humans tend to not pay a lot of attention uh, on the road, especially with the mobile phones in our hands and so on. So the, the number of accidents and the safety impact of mobility is pretty crucial. So at the mission of our company, we wanted to enable that safer transition to autonomous mobility for us to realize the cost uh, advantages, the life savings, and and the productivity that, that we get out of it. I think at the heart of, of, of mobility is that we as humans, we need to be in certain places. We don't want to do a Zoom and video calls the whole time. And in order to be in those places, it takes us a long time to get there. So if we can be productive on the way during transportation, that is transformation. If I can sleep, work, play on my way to wherever I'm trying to go, it's like it's like I'm at home and I'm just getting to where I need to be. So that time savings, I think, is really, that's the golden if mobility, autonomous mobility gives us time to do things that we wouldn't have access to otherwise. And in that transition, being part of that, uh, enabling that wave of transition, we saw that there are bottlenecks in how companies are transforming their, their vehicles and their fleets uh, to be more uh, automated, whether it's full autonomous mobility, like level four robot taxi, as well as a level three or level two ADAS, which is advanced driver assistance. And in that transformation, whether you need new sensor types like LIDARs and imaging radars and so on, or different camera types, different, uh, for example, thermal sensors, different uh, kind of uh, physics capabilities that are, that are available. How do you interpret that data? And how do you take that data and evaluate and validate that it's accurate, that it's performing the way you think it should perform. So that was our first product offering is around data annotation. It's basically taking the data from the sensor suites and adding a meaning on top of it. That, that process is called ground truthing. And the way you generate ground truth data is through annotation. So you annotate that data with humans, as well as tooling and even some AI in the loop to, to give meaning to to the LiDAR data, radar, camera, uh, thermal, etc., And that is required for thousands of months. So whenever you're trying to add these ADAS or M autonomous capabilities, you need to evaluate if the perception and uh, if the vehicle is perceiving the world the right way, uh, whether it's uh, pedestrians, or cyclists, or motorcyclists, or traffic signs, traffic lights, streets, animals, you know, whatever comes in, in their way. Uh, so that annotation challenge is quite, involved, you need to annotate a lot of data and you need to have that data very highly accurate uh, 
and and uh, like the precision, the level of precision around where do you know that this is a person? Like if your feet is on the ground, where does the ground start and your feet end, and then uh, vice versa? So there is these uh, kind of uh, very fine grained pixel level accuracy. You know, at this point, you're talking about a human. At this point, you're looking at the street or the ground and so on. And doing that in multimodal capability, in, in the LiDAR, in the camera, in the radar, and doing that over time. So not just at a single frame, but over many, many seconds or minutes or even hours. Uh, so that's the first uh, segment of, of our work. That's where, where we started. And we look at it. If you want to achieve safety, you need to understand what you're looking at. And to understand what you're looking at, you want to annotate and label the data so you can evaluate its accuracy. That was the beginning of our work. And then as we labeled a lot of data, we discovered that it is the relationships between the sensors was affecting the quality of the perception. So if your camera changed its direction by a small amount with respect to where the LiDAR was collecting the data, you would actually start to uh, miss predict or miscalculate the location or the trajectory of objects. Uh, so if you think of, uh, for example, let's take a very common and existing technology today with emergency braking, the radar and the camera are working together to estimate the distance from the objects ahead of you, uh, whether it's vehicles or other. So if the camera changed its calibration, uh, meaning like, let's say it was looking or straight ahead, the camera started to look further down, just slight degree down. The calculation of the distance uh, from the camera only would, would differ significantly. So maybe at smaller distances, you're not going to see a big uh, deviation. But if you're looking at something that 100 meters away, you might misestimate it by tens of meters because of the change in calibration. Uh, so we saw that as a safety critical component that we started investing in a calibration suite that detects uh, calibration deviation and corrects the calibration between the different sensors and between the sensor and the vehicle. So think of it, camera to vehicle, LiDAR to vehicle, radar to vehicle, IMU to vehicle, all of these sensors that you need to know your location in the world and, and what you're perceiving. Uh, so that's the second category related to our annotation business. And ultimately to evaluate safety it's not just about what you're perceiving and what your sensors are looking at. It's also about the behavior and the decision-making that the vehicle is, is making. Uh, we're not a simulation company. We're not trying to be uh, an, uh, a full ADAS capability company, but we want to enable how enable companies to evaluate the safety of their operation. Uh, so we invested in a database called Safety Pool. Uh, that's a database of safety scenarios. So ultimately, when you launch a new capability, like for example, highway, fully adaptive, cruise controlled, where it's hands off, it's a level three, where the driver can cannot they can afford to not pay attention to the road and like read or watch a movie or something, and the car would drive itself on the highway. So how do you know that your feature uh, that you're launching is safe enough? The, the process or the, the latest and greatest in the validation verification space is you run a lot of potential scenarios against your sensors and against the feature that you've launched to, to see if it's able to handle all of these edge cases, uh, whether like, let's say a vehicle stopped all out of a sudden in front of you or uh, somebody cutting in front of you or someone is coming at you from behind really quickly. And there is a billion, actually almost infinite permutation of things that may happen. Oh, we will never be able to count all of them, but we want to be able to have a baseline to say, where are we from a safety perspective, from coverage perspective, in evaluating the safety of our operation. And so with safety pool, we're looking at enumerating that a basic scenarios that are absolutely your system must handle successfully. In order to say like, yes, we think this system is safe enough to put on the highway or to put in an urban area. Think for level four robo taxi, that, that the number of scenarios is very large, but for level two, level three, 
there is some consensus around what's considered minimal level of safety. We've been successfully working with University of Warwick on, on that database. Uh, so just to kind of sum it up together, we try to enable uh, our customers or the stakeholders who are working on enabling safer ADAS and AV to get there faster. So we help them with labeling the data, with calibrating their sensors, and then evaluating the uh, the safety use case or safety story uh, using these scenarios from the safety pool database. Very good. Very, very good exa uh, examples and explanation. Thank you, Mohamed. Maybe let's go to the annotation for a second. Over the years, and in, in my organization on a global basis, helping OEMs and tier suppliers with their with their sensors, with their compute platforms, and to complete ADAS all the way up to level two and level three uh, type systems. Annotation obviously is a big one because you got to look at data. We have some products in that field as well. I know we've worked together with you with with some of that. I hear a lot of companies advertising that their annotation software or their annotation services are whatever, 90 plus, or in some cases, I think I even heard 99% automated, so no human interaction. What What is it that yours is, and, and where do you see the industry going? Is is 100% really possible? Is there always a need for somebody to also look at it and take some of those maybe edge cases that are hard to detect? Or are, as we develop AI and AI algorithms, neural networks, et cetera, are we getting to a point very soon that, no, nope, all the data I can just fit into this thing, it automatically looks at it and out comes what I missed, what I need to change in my software, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, we've been living and uh, breathing this for, you know, six plus years. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, players set some very wrong expectations around uh, the labeling process and how, uh, to what extent it can be automated and how it can be automated and so on. And, and I'm going to give you a very engineering answer, which is, it depends. That's an economics answer, by the way. I used to use that in my economics class in my MBA. It, well, it depends, you know. It, it, it is very contextual. You know, uh, if, if you're giving me, for example, daytime, sunny, driving on a, on a beautiful highway when everybody's behaving properly, sure, yeah, we can automate all of the vehicle annotation and detections, no problem. But now the devil is in the details. Uh, you're trying to do that same sensor suite in multiple driving scenarios, multiple weather conditions, and add to that maybe even uh, different driving behaviors. Uh, and think think of, th this is where the edge cases start to come in. What if the sun is at a certain angle with respect to the camera and Maybe it's foggy and your or your lidar sensor is generating a lot of noise. Uh, you have some the uh, different materials in the vehicles around you that is causing uh, reflections that are like we call it ghost points uh, from from radars and so on. So that's where the devil is in the details. And the level of automation at some point, if you want to get perfect automation, it will actually cost you more engineering time to get to perfect automation rather than to just do it manually. So, so that balance between where do you invest in automating versus while just let's just get it done with human in the loop. And by in, by having the right system in place to ensure that the human input is also not introducing new mistakes, uh, because the AI can make mistakes, humans can also make mistakes. So it's uh, it's balancing kind of these two two operations and looking at the economics while you're doing that. Uh, so ultimately with our tooling is we say to the customer, our tools come with some built-in AI to achieve the minimum uh, basics uh, of automation. Uh, we also allow the customer to use their own system to help in the automation so that because we will never collect thousands of miles like our customers. That's not our job. We are tooling and technology companies. But the customer has that data and they have the AI models that are more accurate and more capable than what we have. So they can export the output of their AI into the labeling tool and have the humans just assist in the verification and validation of these labels. So we allow that in our tools. And then on top of it, we've built a significant number of automated quality checks and validation 
that looks over what the AI is doing and what the human is doing across multiple people, across multiple runs, and looks at heuristics and kind of different signals to bring all of that together and give you at the end uh, a workflow to allow you to get a productive labeling operation. So we don't sort of, uh, we don't force a recipe on you. You can choose any recipe that you like, but we give you the tools, uh, you know, the, the utensils and the, the equipment uh, to, to, cook it any, to cook it any way you want, but to get to the result that, that is satisfactory to you. So that's our approach. And uh, like you said, there are so many vendors, some of them come at it from extreme technical capability where they say, yes, we're going to achieve extreme automation. And on the other spectrum, you get uh, some people who say, we have thousands of people that we can give them to you at a very low cost. And there are ethical issues around that and, you know, like how you treat people and how you compensate them, uh, which we think is is not fair. And obviously, like, we don't want to go there. Uh, so in between, like, low-cost labor and full automation, where where do you draw the line? And we try to be that balanced in the middle where we use, um, we have our own team to do the service. Uh, we pay them uh, market rates uh, where they're happy uh, working for us. Actually, we have sponsored many marriages, enabled many marriages of uh, our labeling employees because they are viewed to have a stable job with good income where they live uh, and also keeping the customers happy uh, with the quality and the level of automation that we can provide. And I guess our biggest differentiation is we're very transparent. We, we kind of sit down with the customer and we tell them, this is your accuracy target. Here's what the humans can do effectively on average to get to that level of, of accuracy that you want. So uh, where do you want us to invest? We can obviously put more human hours or we can put more engineering hours, but the, some something has to happen to get that level of accuracy at scale that the customer wants. So if you have 2 billion miles that need to be annotated, I think it's worth investing the engineering hours to automate and help bring uh, the quality of the automation much, much higher. But if you have two kilometers that you want to annotate, ultimately, I think at this point, we might as well just do it with humans. And having that transparency and that conversation openly with with the AI engineer, with the perception team, with the safety team that is doing validation and enabling them to have uh, just a very good understanding of the trade-offs from a quality perspective, on the engineering side and on the human labor side, uh, makes everyone just understand there's no magic in here. It's just science, right? Uh, that's where kind of we've uh, proven ourselves. And uh, luckily we've had customers that have been working with us for over five years, annotating their data, uh, both for training and validation purposes in, in Germany, in Austria with the ABL team. We've had that uh, great relationship for four plus years now, and we continue uh, to evolve it and grow it over time. Yeah, very good. So let me ask you this. I mean, in the industry, right, we're talking about the likes of Waymo and Tesla having tons of data, doing a great job with their, let's just call it ADAS and autonomous systems. And then there's there's others in the world that maybe struggle a little more because they maybe have less real world data and and uh, and the capability and knowledge and how to what to do with this data, how to annotate it, how to use it, how to feed it back into their system. But independent of what the company is, what are the ones from from your perspective that you may have worked with, continue to work with, or are looking at it from an industry's perspective? The ones that do a really good job of, let's say, analyzing the data again, annotating, reusing it, changing algorithms in their in their ADAS algorithms or autonomous algorithms. So feed it back into the vehicle. What are the ones that are doing really good better than the ones that are not doing so good? Without mentioning any any name, just an idea of to our listeners and viewers, if you really want to do good from your perspective, from Deepin's perspective, from Mohamed's perspective, what do you see they do better or they do really, really well? versus maybe what the industry in general is doing? Yeah, great question. And, and like you said, without mentioning any names, there are a pattern that we've seen across the board working with Japanese clients, German clients, French uh, in the US, North America in general, 
and and even South Korea and so on. The ones that have invested in the quality of the data get a lot higher return on investment. So you want to avoid garbage in, garbage out scenarios. Uh, and it's, this is like the biggest differentiator is that customers who have took the time to ensure that their data collection is solid, to ensure that the calibration is flawless. Uh, so you're not collecting data that will be very different than what the, your vehicle is going to operate in. So the more representative the data that you are collecting to what the actual vehicle in production will look uh, will look at, then you will get the most benefit of the effort that you're doing. So it's uh, it's really around the, avoiding this garbage in, garbage out uh, scenarios. And, and we sum it up in, in the deep end language is how good is the calibration? How good is the localization? How good is the synchronization between the multiple sensors? Uh, so it, those three elements are really the key accuracy triggers that can cause your annotation cost to be much higher and can cause you to collect and spend a lot of money on data that you're going to end up throwing away. So anything that enables you to reuse the data is obviously going to going to bring a lot more return on investment for you. So if you've annotated some data, you can reuse it. If uh, Or even if you change the sensors, you can at least apply uh, some transformations to help you make uh, intelligent decisions about, like, why is this sensor really better than this sensor? If you don't have, if you cannot freeze the variables in order to make apples to apples comparison, is this LiDAR really better than this LiDAR? But if you collected the data differently between your evaluation of LiDAR 1 versus LiDAR 2, you will make wrong conclusions because you don't have apples to apples comparison. Is it is it really the physics of the sensor? Or is it the range? Or is it the the frequency? Or is it the like other characteristics, for example, FMCW LiDAR versus a flash LiDAR or a rotating LiDAR and so on? There are pros and cons across the board. There is no perfect solution in in any in any of the sensors, and the trade-offs have to be made. So, if you are making the right decisions about those trade-offs based on the data you're collecting, then you will be in 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 like inherently making better decisions along the way. Uh, and that's how I would like summarize it with that one thing. Yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. That's perfect. Two more questions for you, Mohan. <clears throat> one. Yeah. I know you mentioned at the beginning, you know, in, in 17, when you founded the company, right? Excited about that in 2021, we're going to drive around in autonomous vehicles. Here we are today and we're thinking maybe in five years again, right? With the mindset of what are you looking for in, in five years? And it can be that maybe in five years, we are going to truly have uh, a more large scale deployment of autonomous vehicles. But what specifically are you looking forward in, in five years? What's to happen in mobility, either in the space you're working in, in the uh, AI space, annotation space, different types of vehicles, doesn't matter. Again, podcast is about mobility. So what is your excitement going to be in, in five years? What are you looking forward to to happening in five years? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the top of my list would be ADAS. I think autonomy at scale economically, like what Waymo and Cruise and Motional and Zooks are doing. I think it's lofty and we will get there at some point, but to make that economic, meaning that the cost of the vehicle, the density of the operation, the the cost of map collection and so on, to make that economic, I think that will take a while. So I'm a lot more excited and hopeful in the capabilities that are gonna come from driver assistance. Uh, given that it has immediate impact on safety. It will immediately save lives. It will immediately affect vehicles on the road today. We don't have to wait 15 years for that to happen. It will it will bring benefits to the drivers as well as to the OEMs because they can sell these features at a slightly higher cost, hopefully better margins, and, and bring the benefit kind of to society along the way. Sure, sure. Oh, that's perfect, perfect. And final question for you, what is the next car you're going to buy and why? So the next car would be electric. I think uh, that we, we've, uh, we've gotten to the point where 
I am I am ready to own an electric vehicle. Now, which brand uh, that is still to be determined. I I have been driving a Volvo uh, XC90 for a long time. Uh, there is an electric version of it coming. There is also a number of like exciting electric vehicles that are SUVs that are happening. I think Lucid is working on gravity. Obviously, there is Tesla Model X. I think uh, Volkswagen has launched the ID6 as well. Uh, so I haven't done the full evaluation of electric SUVs just yet. But if you have any hints or suggestions, I'd love to hear them. No, I mean, the problem is, right, every day or almost every month, there's more coming out, right? I mean, you have now Fisker selling cars, you have VinFast, so now you suddenly have some of the startups or, or other newer transplants coming. And certainly, I mean, if you look at what Hyundai has done uh, in electric vehicles over the last few year, years, very impressive. And then clearly the, uh, the local, the U.S. OEMs, uh, Stellantis, more of a global or maybe more of a European OEM, but clearly also bringing products to the market. GM with a heavy onslaught of a lot of different options. And Ford doing, I think, a great job with the Mach-E and with the uh, Ford Lightning uh, pickup truck. I think pretty soon you're gonna, it's going to be more and more uh, difficult to do. So maybe maybe Deep needs to come up with some AI-based uh, data analysis uh, program to help people buy the uh, next electric car. I don't know. Maybe we're on onto some big idea. <laughs> hey, hey, maybe we can work together on that, you know. Mohamed, thank you so much for your time. Great explanation on what you guys are doing and how important data is and how important it is to have the right sensors. And as, as you so properly said, it, those who really focus on the data, collect the data, analyze the data, are the ones that are also more successful in implementing these systems are very accurate. Thank you so much for your time, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks for listening to Reimagine Mobility Podcast. If you liked this episode, please subscribe and tell a friend.